With the Rucker McGrory saga still ongoing, the Jets are trying to take care of other business in between. Find out what's going to happen over the next couple of weeks and in the future on tonight's episode of Locked On Winnipeg Jets. You're locked on the Hockey Jets, your daily podcast on the Winnipeg Jets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey friends and welcome to tonight's episode of Locked On, Winnipeg Jets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Harrison Lee, an avid Winnipeg Jets fan and an online blogger. You can follow me on Twitter at HLivingLoco and at LO underscore Winnipeg Jets. Thanks for making Locked On Jets your first listen of the day every day. If you like what you're hearing, be sure to like, follow, and subscribe on all of your favorite podcasting platforms and YouTube. Doing so, of course, is always free of charge and ensures you never miss another episode. More than anything, though, we just love and appreciate your support, especially during this, of course, slower off-season period uh, for the Jets. It's been anything but slow, for being honest. Lots of 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 little moves here and there, but I think, of course, the majority thing tends to have subsumed the entire season conversation and uh, continues to be a source of contention. Thanks to all the recent Habs fans for making um, last episode a bit of a fun comment section been a, a lively convo in the comments um most people have avoided anything that's not too uh or or avoided being uncivil so thanks for that but in the meantime of course for us winnipeg fans uh we're still trying to figure out you know stuff around the margins right the jets still have a number of contracts to nail down and i also wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about uh the future for winnipeg because after this coming season it's going to be pretty interesting to see what Winnipeg's long-term plan is. A lot of guys are expiring. A lot of contracts are finishing up with the current core. And how much of that current core the Jets bring back is up for debate. So we'll take a look at that in just a moment. But before we go too much further, just wanted to let you know that tonight's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and be sure to use promo code Locked on NHL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms do apply. Now, looking at Winnipeg's uh, multi-year map out, right, the Jets don't have a lot of high-end salary locked up for the future. Obviously, Shifley and Hellebuck and Morrissey, uh, along with DeMello, they've all got at least four years or so uh, in the books, which is good. Uh, Morrissey's next contract is going to be really interesting to think about. Uh, Josh, you know, he's going to be um, a free agent, I think, around age 32 or 33. So uh, obvi obviously, you know, how much longer he continues to be a top end defender, you may wonder, but I, I kind of have to imagine they'll extend him in some capacity. He is in many ways, one of our new faces of the franchise, not really a new face, but I think over the past couple of years, he's really asserted himself and become one of the most prominent and recognizable players on this team, right? He's sort of taken on uh, the, the new Bufflin or the new, wheeler if you will and in some ways you know i can see him getting a pretty hefty raise whether the jets should do that i don't know we'll have to see um but it's just kind of interesting to see how his career arc has really evolved and you know by the time that his current contract you know ends and stuff maybe they they do a little bit of an adjustment maybe they give him a raise i don't really know uh that's going to be you know a, a more distant conversation Usually by that age, you don't really see players signing huge mega deals. Um, so we'll see if Winnipeg maybe tries to work a different salary number, because right now he's definitely like under value for what he's bringing. I mean, the guy is just killing it for Winnipeg. So um, that that six point two five million that Winnipeg has as his current cap hit sure looks cheap. And for a long time, it didn't seem like it was going to be that way. But man, has he been an absolute stud for the Jets? And uh, again, I, I just have have always uh, wanted him to really thrive and seeing him happy and enjoying himself is just pretty darn cool. As far as the Jets defense is concerned, um, you know, there aren't too, too many players that I think are going to be uh, coming back. You know, Neil Pionk may, if the Jets want to try and resign him at a lower price point. But I feel like with how many players are coming through Winnipeg systems and stuff, I just don't really see why they would. In fact, I still wonder if he gets traded sometime this season. He's got a pretty big cap hit. His performance on the ice has really declined recently. 
And the Jets just kind of need to retool and change how this blue line functions. Dylan Sandberg, on the other hand, he deserves a really hefty raise and a long-term deal. Um, and, and really, his role has grown with this team uh, for the past couple of seasons. He has increasingly earned bigger minutes, uh, bigger priority in the lineup. And I think at this point, you know, with him being 26 and probably around 27 by the time his current deal ends after the season, it's time to really lock him up for the foreseeable future. Uh, I'd love to see a six or a seven year deal for him. Maybe, you know, in the five and a half million, six and a half million range. Uh, I don't quite know what they're going to award him. Um, probably less than Morrissey is my case, is, is my guess. Uh, and and Sandberg, you know, six may be a little crazy to, to offer, but uh, we'll see how that sort of um, inflation uh, measure kind of uh, adjusts for his cap hit, because obviously the cap ceiling is going to raise. Um, his responsibilities have uh, significantly increased, but I think the one thing that kind of hurts him is that he doesn't score a lot of points. So maybe it gets him, you know, at around five ish million. We'll see. Um, you know, we saw DeMello and, and a couple of other players recently extend around the four to four and a half or even almost five range. And maybe that's where Sandberg will fall. Um, either way, though, he's been a really instrumental part of this team. He is like the first young defender on this team that's going to be up for extension in a very long time. And so for me, trying to even think about what he gets now is a little bit of a harder question to answer. Uh, I know Logan Stanley technically counts, but Logan is also not really the same caliber of player. So harder for me to get a read on that next contract extension. Other than that, you're not really seeing a lot of Jets D that are going to need deals. You have a lot of fringe players, guys in the sort of uh, Coughlin or, or Hayden Fleury or even Colin Miller range, but most of these players, unless they really hit it out of the park with their either their their show me deals with the Jets or um, in Miller's case, you know he, he's probably getting closer and closer to hanging it up than he is signing a long term deal. So I, I, I do expect there to be some natural turnover, um, but you know other than that, I don't think the Jets are going to be bringing too too many of these guys back unless they really show in some capacity. And, and prove that they really are somebody that, you know, Winnipeg wants to maybe invest a little bit of term in for a, a you know, I would say a more rotational option. Uh, I, I usually don't want to give a lot of term to those kinds of guys, but the Moose, if they can get, you know, a couple of players like Fleury or, or Coughlin around for a few years, wouldn't be the worst. Um, up front, I think you have much bigger questions. Obviously, Velarde give him a huge contract extension after the season. I think, you know, should he stay healthy, he's going to be one of those players that's going to be a, a key part of the core going forward. Baron, uh, definitely somebody that I think is really important to um, start to look at as, as maybe a bigger piece of this team in the future. I don't quite know what his absolute ceiling is because, you know, he scored lots of goals in very limited minutes. He's shown well, and he's had some real growth to his overall game. That makes you think that there's a, there's a little more there, but then again, he is 26 now. So what he is at this point is probably closer to what his uh, final product is going to be. And so um, tell you what, though, for the, the the contract price that he's at currently, he is an absolute steal of a player. Now, the big one that I think a lot of us are sort of looking at uh, is Kyle Connor, because after 25, 26, he's up. And I think at this point, the Jets would be better off not having him come back at the end of his current deal. But I'm almost certain that he will be extended. It's going to be a mega deal, I'm sure. And I just don't really feel like that would be the right approach. I love KFC. He's a lot of fun. But let's be real, right? Among all of our top end skaters, he continues to be one of the most limited. And I think that's where you have a lot of questions about a, how much longer he can keep doing this, and B, if his game is is too limiting um, in the way that he has to be uh, supported for him to be really at his best. And it, it's it's tough to say, but uh, after this season, um, I really would think about a, a trade. I think at this point, you know, he's been a, a mainstay for this Jets team for many years. He's a very fun player, but unless he really takes some sort of a quantum leap forward, I, I just don't think the big raise that he's about to be due is necessarily going to be worth it. So tough call for the Jets, but I think at some point this is where you're you're, you're really thinking about that whole 5 to 10% better and trying to make this team more balanced 
uh, more well-rounded, better constructed. And so it's not just really reliant on a couple of key skill sets. It actually plays a more complete game. And, you know, for as much as uh, I would love to have Kyle Connor back in many ways, I think the limitations inherent to his game makes it a, a really hard sell. So the Jets have a very complicated future in the next couple of seasons. That's why we've talked about this being sort of the end of their competitive window with this core. Uh, the Jets are going to try and retool on the fly here with a number of rookies and prospects, but let's be real. Uh, retooling is, is only going to get you so much before at some point you have to make some much tougher decisions. As it is, the Jets also still have a couple of contracts that they're waiting for some feedback on. A couple of players who um, they've qualified and are still trying to work around and honestly uh, make some some negotiations with. Uh, there's one in particular uh, that I want to focus on in Spotlight because I feel like this contract obviously has a lot of bearing on Winnipeg's future. And with the Jets needing to make some very um, key decisions going forward as to how this team is built, this one is one of those that I'm hoping the next deal is long term. I can almost guarantee it's not going to be. We'll talk about this deal in just a little bit. But before we go any further, I did want to shout out our friends and partners at Game Time. When it comes to buying tickets, a lot of us are used to paying huge fees. Uh, there are surprise charges. And sometimes when you're buying a ticket to a concert or your favorite sporting event, look, you buy the ticket, you see it on the seat map, but you're not actually sure what the view is like. And if you've ever been to Fenway, you know that there's an infamous spot where there is a giant pillar blocking your view. Now, most venues don't have this, uh, you know, around the world. But hey, if you happen to pay, you know, buy the one ticket in one seat that does have it, it's probably a big pain in the butt. And no one wants to spend loads of money to stare at either the back of somebody's head or a giant pillar that they weren't really anticipating blocking their view. Game time totally gets it. They understand your pain. And that's why they want to offer you last minute deals, all in prices and views from your seat, all backed with their lowest price guarantee. It's why they've become an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets faster and easier. Prices in the game time app actually go down the closer you get to first pitch, which for those of you who love saving money is a fantastic deal. They also offer flash sales and zone deals. And again, they come back with their lowest price guarantee and event cancellation protection. It makes it so much easier, so much more pain free, and it takes all of the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets and other events. So Download the Game Time app, create an account, and be sure to use promo code Locked on NHL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L O C K E D O N N H L for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Hey, friends, and welcome back to this episode of Locked On Winnipeg Jets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Every day, thank you so much for rejoining us on tonight's episode as we are just uh, checking in on a number of different deals and, and things for the Jets, both in the short term and in the longer term future. Obviously, Winnipeg is still going through the offseason, albeit it's been quiet uh, on the contractual side of things. Um, DeMello probably being the most notable uh, extension. You know, the, the Shifley and Hellebuck deals last offseason, I think, were really sort of the linchpins of Winnipeg's future and sort of determined which direction the Jets were going to go. And so now it's sort of aligning everyone else over the next few years under that structure. So in the meantime, the Jets do have two very big contracts, uh, one in particular that's going to take more precedence uh, for you know the team to figure out. We'll talk about those two deals in one moment, but before we go any further, just wanted to let you know for all you Fox Sports or ESPN watchers, if you find yourselves having to turn on the volume with all the shouting, you should make the switch to Locked On Sports Today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel program for you daily to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked On Sports Today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. All part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Now, circling back to the Jets, obviously, uh, you know, Winnipeg has two RFAs that are likely to be very big parts of the future. Um, there's some other guys, like, of course, uh, Simon Lundmark, but, you know, we're, we're looking really at two players, Cole Perfetti and Billy Heinola. Um, and Perfetti, in particular, is a guy that, for a lot of Jets fans, myself included, continues to be one of those 
um, really key parts of Winnipeg's future and and their present that I think Winnipeg really needs to invest in and see if they can lock up long term. He's you know uh, almost on his way to age twenty three. He's really in his prime, and in some ways we're still trying to figure out what he is best at. But I think he's really grown. I think he has already showed enough flash to where if you can get him locked up for five or six years um, at a pretty reasonable cap hit, like, you know, 6 million or so, I think you're going to derive a load of value out of that. Uh, I know a lot of people are going to say what in his pattern suggests he should be paid that much. He hasn't played a lot of games yet and he doesn't have a load of points, but if you actually look at the scoring rate under the surface and how much he's actually accomplished relative to his time on ice, he is one of our highest primary scoring rate players on the team. There's not many guys uh, putting it in the back of the net as frequently as he is and contributing as much offense as he is. And it's very interesting because, you know, his strongest overall impact is actually in his defensive play. Otherwise, you don't see him creating loads of chances, but he just seemingly is a magnet for points. He's such a skilled playmaker and, and honestly an underrated shooter. And I think his game is only going to get stronger and stronger from here. I feel like towards the end of last season, when he started getting back into the lineup, you saw that confident release of his fool a number of goalies. He's got a great shot. He's such a smart player. And I really feel like he has to be one of those guys that you um, really prioritize locking up. Now, his incentive to do so is low, right? I really don't think he's going to accept a long-term offer. I think it'd be great if he did. But for um, Perfetti's own future, I suspect he'll do a like a two-year bridge or something. Basically, you know, the next couple of years, he'll sort of prove it. Uh, by age 25-ish, I would expect him to be ready to maybe sign his first long-term extension, which is fine. I think if the Jets go this route and if he opts for it too, uh, then Winnipeg really needs to make use of that additional cap space and chase like another top D of some sort because... Um, Perfetti is going to get very expensive at the end of his next deal if he does do the bridge. And I think it's important for Winnipeg to maximize what they can while they can, while they're getting a surplus value out of, out of a player like him. Um, I think he's going to have a monster next season under Arneal. I really am a strong believer in him being an elite player. That's just waiting for the right opportunity to really show what he is. And if he has a big next season I can tell you again, He's going to be expensive in a couple of seasons. So for the Jets, uh, I think that there is some imperative to try and get him locked up sooner rather than later. Um, but of course, I'm, I don't think that there's a lot of incentive for him to do so unless he really loves playing in Winnipeg and unless he's willing to commit. We'll see. I, I, I have been surprised by things before. Um, maybe he wants to stick around and he feels confident in the direction of the team and is willing to maybe leave some dollars on the table to stay here for you know, the next six or so years. We'll see. Uh, I feel like that's probably a really ambitious read, but you never know. The other RFA that's probably notable is Vili Heinola. Um, obviously, he got a qualifying offer too, but um, Vili has never really had a chance to fight for a bigger roster spot. Even when he had strong performances in limited NHL minutes, he just never really seemed to get the favor of any of the recent coaching staffs. But now he finally has a chance under Arneal to seize um, probably the fifth spot. You know, that third left, uh, left-hand left spot I think is going to be his to lose at this point. I know that they just re-signed Stanley. But listen, Heinle was supposed to make the lineup last year. And I think with Vili, uh, this is probably his best chance of his career thus far to actually prove that he deserves this role. His preseason showing last year was phenomenal, and I expect him to have another really big preseason. He's already proven just about everything that he can at the AHL level, and I think at this at this point he wants to really take that next step and get NHL time. He's had to wait a, a fairly unreasonable amount to try and actually get the spot, but it finally seems like it's coalescing, and I would expect him to sort of do another bridge situation where you know maybe he signs for a year or two, and then they revisit it at the end of the extension. Uh, I think he'll be a, a key contributor for Winnipeg's future. I'm very excited for him. It would be interesting to see if he tries to swap to the right side uh, at some point, right? Because 
he can play on his offhand, and he's actually pretty good at it, especially relative to what you see with most defenders. Guys who play on their offhands usually see a dip in their performance, but with Heinola, it's really not as noticeable. So something to keep in mind, uh, especially once Pionk's deal expires. Salomonson's also going to be filtering in, in here at some point, and the Jets, quite frankly, have a lot of left side uh, defenders, more so than they do on the right. So Villy's development is going to be really interesting. I know that his ceiling has probably declined a bit since uh, he's had a lot of interruptions to his overall dev cycle, but I still have a lot of hope for him, and I'm hoping that this season finally proves to everyone why I've been one of his biggest uh, supporters over the last few years. There's a core <laughs> part of the fan base that I, I think has really enjoyed him and thinks that he's got something really special in the tank. I continue to be one of those people. Uh, it'd be cool to be proven right about him. I think that he's got a lot of potential still and that he could be a really regular performer this year, but he's got some serious work to do to get there. And uh, now is his time to really show people why he was such a touted draft pick when he was taken. So fun stuff for the Jets. Uh, we'll probably get a better sense of these deals over the next few weeks. I can't imagine the negotiations are going to take that much longer. I think both parties are going to arrive at a solution uh, sooner than later. So we'll see how that goes. But let me know who you're expecting here to really take a, a big part of the future and, and present roles and who you think is really going to thrive this upcoming season. Like I said, obviously the Jets' future remains... Uh, relatively um, a, a work in progress, but they did get one more deal finished, and it's kind of funny that it took this long. They have finally not only announced uh, Dylan Coughlin officially as a trade, but they've also got his contract extension in place. We'll talk about maybe why that took so long and if it means that there's some other stuff behind the scenes in just a little bit. Hey friends, and welcome back to this episode of Locked On, Winnipeg Jets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Every day, thank you so much for rejoining us on tonight's episode as we're just wrapping up with some final thoughts uh, ahead of Winnipeg's, um, you know, next couple of weeks of the offseason. It's been not necessarily quiet in terms of drama. There's been plenty of drama. Maybe a little bit quieter if you're the Jets and you're hoping for um, some, some big prospect announcements some major developments. You know, the McGrory thing has kind of overtaken the entire offseason conversation. And uh, it'd be nice to at some point just get some some clarity on that. But for Winnipeg, obviously, they're still doing some other stuff in between. One of those little deals that they did uh, recently, other than like Hayden Flurry, was to also bring in Dylan Coughlin, which is kind of funny because, again, he's another former Kane. Uh, he has, I think, spent some time working with Chenoweth, uh, maybe a, a, in the prior seasons. But uh, Coughlin, you know, is another sort of buy low candidate where you swing. You maybe hope that his ability as a right hander has been a little bit underappreciated. He was with Vegas before, you know, he joined Carolina um, and, you know, he's had some interesting under the under the surface numbers. Uh, I don't know that he's had a, a real big NHL run other than some games with Vegas. And, you know, he's had a couple of games with the Canes. Didn't really look like uh, too, too much for Carolina, but with the Jets having, you know, a, a really strong defensive structure and some room for growth on the right side, he and Flurry were obviously very cheap pickups for basically nothing. You know, the Jets really didn't have to give up anything. Winnipeg gets a couple of depth players who can help the Moose. And, you know, with both of them being 26, it's not like they're, you know, entirely uh, out of the question for being routine NHLers. Both of them may have something in the tank, and it could help Winnipeg to stabilize maybe the third pairing D on that right side. Strangely, though, the Coughlin deal just seemingly took forever for some reason, and there was a lot of speculation as to why that was. One thought was that he was originally part of either a rucker McGroarty deal or perhaps an Ehlers deal. Not necessarily that he was like a key piece at all. He was just sort of a roster toss in, maybe a bit of a balancing thing. And um, that, of course, didn't really materialize. Uh, Carolina has indicated that they're interested in both players to a degree, at least according to the reports. Ehlers, I definitely believe. McCrory, I'm a little bit less certain on, but it could be a part of the, the equation. We'll have to see on that one. But for some reason, all of the announcements around Coughlin's move just seemingly took ages. And maybe it was just because it wasn't that big of a priority and the front office was just sort of 
uh, dragging its feet for, for some of the paperwork, especially as folks are in and out for vacation. But it was a little unusual because almost every other deal, they didn't really have to worry about, you know, you know, uh, an announcing very slowly. They mostly got all of the information out fairly timely, especially once um, the move was made public via some news source. So the Coughlin thing taking as long as it did was a little unusual. Uh, if Carolina really is intent on trading for Ehlers or McGrory, obviously the player that you know comes to mind is Nietzsche. Maybe there's something else peripherally that the Jets are looking at to acquire. Carolina is definitely hot to trot for Nick. They have apparently made uh, some bigger offers, I understand, or at least have really stepped up their pursuit. Either way, I think he does make a lot of sense for the Canes. I think if you're looking for a replacement for Gensel, Ehlers makes a ton of sense. Um, Nick does have some injury concerns that I think are certainly an issue for the Canes to think about, but overall, right, stylistically and, and sort of the player that he is, his profile, uh, the fit, it just makes a, it, it makes too much sense to me. Um, and Carolina has one of those systems where they've got a lot of prospects to draw from. They've got some good roster players that they probably don't want to throw a lot of money at and maybe want to uh, send on because they worry that there are some red flags in their profiles that suggests that maybe they're not going to quite be as 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 worth it as some of their other core players. I think for the Jets, though, if Nietzsche really is uh, the core piece that would be coming back, I don't really think that you could complain too much. Obviously, I have some mixed thoughts on Nietzsche's game. But again, if you're talking about who really makes the most sense as a roster player coming back, a guy who can play both down the middle and on the wing, uh, I suppose you really couldn't be too upset. Nietzsche is skilled. He's a great finisher. And he's still, you know, relatively within prime age. So, um, you know, you're, you're not going to find many fits that are going to align with exactly what you want. So sometimes you really do just have to take the best fit. And when you've got an expiring winger and a player who's disgruntled as a prospect, well, you probably have to just expect that. You, you listen, right? The returns maybe not going to be as much as you hope it would, but there's also Zegras out there. That could be another thing for the Jets to look at. Um, you, you've got a couple of players who are sort of a little bit out of favor with their current teams or maybe just asking for more than you know their current squads are really interested in offering. So uh, a lot for the Jets to consider, but it is interesting that the Coughlin thing took as long as it did. I have to feel he was at some point part of some other move, just again, as like a roster balancing sort of thing, but it seems like that until now has fallen through. So We'll see if the Jets end up reconnecting on some other deal with the Canes. They've got plenty of stuff that I'm sure Carolina wants, and the Canes can offer the Jets some things to help fill out our system. But let me know where you think Ehlers and McGrory end up. Drop your thoughts in the comments below or at my social medias at HLLivingLoco and at LO underscore Winnipeg Jets. For tonight's episode, though, that's going to be all the time that we have. Thanks so much for making Locked On Jets your first listen of the day every day. We'll see you back here next week with more Jets offseason coverage. So as always, see you then. Have a great night and go Jets go.